The United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution on Gaza, but without calling for an immediate ceasefire. What is stopping this body from calling for an end to Israel's brutal bombing? South Korea's Supreme Court has upheld two rulings that ordered Japanese, company to pay, Japanese companies to pay compensation for Korean forced labor victims. And this was under Japanese colonial rule. What are the implications of this verdict? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. The United States actively sabotaged the UN Security Council resolution on a ceasefire in Gaza by forcing a change in the language. The resolution had initially called for, to quote, a sustainable cessation of hostilities. But under US pressure, it ended up calling for, to quote again, urgent steps to immediately allow safe and unhindered humanitarian access and also for creating conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. Now, after this intervention, the US ended up not voting for the resolution anyway and abstained. The resolution passed with 13 votes in support and two abstentions. We go to Abdul for the details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, could you take us through what happened at the UN Security Council? A lot of discussion over the past few days. The US really pushing its agenda and then abstaining. What happened? Well, Prashant, the United Nations Security Council finally voted on a resolution uh, which basically demands for uh, greater humanitarian aid inside Gaza and uh, talks about creating a mechanism which basically provides aid to all parts of Gaza just, uh, without any interruption. Uh, it does not, uh, of course, it talks about release of uh, captives and talks about the ways to find, uh, ways to be found uh, to kind of cease hostilities, but does not say anything about ceasefire. Has basically, uh, US uh, has been delaying uh, the, uh, the voting for last three days at least, uh, four days. Uh, in which it basically had objections to the uh, earlier drafts which talked about suspension of hostilities. First it talked about ceasefire, then it was watered down to suspension of hostilities. None of these uh, 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 provisions were, were acceptable uh, to the United States. Uh, even while when uh, the Security Council was voting it on it uh, on, on Friday, uh, after all the negotiations, uh, U.S. Uh, did not uh, basically agree, did not agree to kind of uh, support uh, any uh, any draft which basically talked about or hinted about uh, ceasefire. So uh, it is a kind of compromise uh, which basically uh, has uh, resulted in a, a, a very uh, mild uh, resolution which does not say anything. Uh, and does not give uh, any hope about uh, peace uh, uh, in, in Gaza. Uh, it basically means that the Israel can continue uh, bombing uh, uh, Gaza and its ground offensive can continue. Uh, it also means that there is no pressure on Israel to basically uh, do something about a, a kind of, uh, to basically stop uh, the war in Gaza. Uh, at the last moment, Russians uh, tried to introduce an amendment which basically uh, talked about uh, some kind of suspension of hostilities for a while. Uh, even that was vetoed by the US and that basically led to uh, a situation where Russia basically abstained on the final draft which was finally uh, uh, accepted. By the way, the, the, the strange fact is even after negotiating all of this, uh, and, and forcing the other members of the United Nations Security Council to water down their uh, appeals of ceasefire, U.S. ultimately did not vote uh, in favor of the resolution and abstained. It did not want to look <coughs> as if it wants to uh, <coughs> kind of uh, uh, sit with the countries which basically are in favor, on, favor of uh, 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 ceasefire in any way, even remotely. And that is the only message which comes out of what happened uh, in the Security Council on Friday. So uh, uh, that is the situation uh, about the United Nations Security Council resolution, which was ad adopted on Friday. And uh, the, the resolution has no uh, meaning uh, and, and does not have any impact on the uh, overall uh, 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 the hostilities uh, which uh, 
uh, in Gaza. It does not have any impact on uh, or any possibility. It does not bring any possibility of ceasefire uh, there. Abdul, we're ending, of course, another week, another week of continuous attacks, very brutal attacks. Would give us the situation, to tell us a bit about the situation on the ground in Palestine right now. Well, Prashant, as far as the situation in, in Gaza is concerned, the fighting continues. Uh, Israel has, uh, Israel continue to bomb uh, different parts of uh, Gaza. Uh, in fact, it has, there are reports coming that it has used maximum number of uh, ammunition and one of the most uh, deadly weapons uh, inside Gaza in the last few days. And the overall uh, casualties of Palestinians has, in, has, has reached uh, almost uh, 21,000 uh, uh, and more than 55,000 Palestinians have been wounded. Uh, there are reports coming that uh, the, there are ground of uh, there are fights going on between the uh, invading Israeli forces and uh, the Palestinian resistance forces in different parts of Gaza. Uh, as per the latest report, uh, the, uh, the Israeli forces have suffered some kind of, uh, you can say, uh, setbacks in terms of a number of their soldiers being killed. But uh, of course, that number remains a very small number. The, the actual uh, number of Palestinians uh, being killed on every hour in every hour in the Gaza is increasing day by day. Overall humanitarian situation is becoming worse, bad to worse. According to the UN's latest finding, almost uh, 500,000 plus Palestinians are living in, in complete starvation, in a very dire situation where they are not able to full, uh, get even the minimum food which is required for them to survive. Uh, and that, that number is basically going to increase given the fact that despite the fact that the Security Council has voted for a greater access for humanitarian aid, uh, it, it does not seem that the Israel is in any uh, obligation to basically implement that resolution uh, because there is no punitive measures which is going to be taken uh, in the few uh, if Israel says it will not implement uh, the Security Council resolution, and uh, that means that the overall hurdles uh, and the objection uh, hurdles and the uh, uh, restrictions which Israel has imposed on the delivery of humanitarian aid inside Gaza will continue uh, in the coming uh, days. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, the, uh, the health situation uh, in Gaza, of course, is deteriorating. No, more hospitals have be, uh, come under attack and, and uh, it, become, it becomes impossible now to, uh, to the health workers, health staff in the uh, uh, operating inside Gaza to function uh, anymore. Primarily, in fact, the majority of the hospitals have now completely shut down and uh, uh, a new uh, the hospitals which have been operating uh, despite all the problems in the last few uh, months are on the verge of shutting down. So this is the overall uh, uh, situation inside Gaza and it has deteriorated in the last 24 hours. Number of people, Palestinians have killed, have uh, hundreds of more Palestinians have been killed uh, uh, and that is that situation is it seems will continue because the Security Council has refused to uh, adopt a resolution asking for immediate ceasefire. Right, and finally, could you also maybe take us through what is happening regionally? We know that there's been a lot of pushback from resistance forces across the region. So what is happening over there? Well, Prashant, as far as the uh, global and regional responses to both the UN Security Council resolution, as well as the overall situation in, in Gaza is concerned, uh, uh, it seems uh, that apart from uh, uh, Russians, uh, there, there are more countries which, of course, more countries which, are not, which were not happy with the way the U.S. pressurized uh, the United Nations Security Council uh, to basically adopt a resolution which does not have any meaning, in fact. Uh, and that has basically led to uh, greater uh, disenchantments. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Hezbollah has claimed that they basically started a new set of attacks against the Israeli forces in the northern Gaza, in northern Israel, particularly in response to 
what the Israeli forces have been doing, attacking the southern Lebanon, the southern Lebanon, uh, uh, destroying a lot of uh, 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 homes, uh, civilian infrastructure in the last few uh, days. Uh, according to the uh, latest report, uh, Hezbollah has claimed that uh, its attack has led to uh, uh, the kind of uh, destruction of some of the Israeli posts, uh, military posts and a killing of uh, a couple of Israeli soldiers. Though, of course, these reports are not verified. Um, meanwhile, Houthis have uh, reacted uh, to the US attempts to create an international coalition uh, the uh, the uh, basically prosperity guardians uh, the operation Par prosperity guardians um, which is basically a naval alliance uh, created by the us uh, uh, according to the us there are 20 countries now which have become part of it houthis have said that despite this uh, creation of uh, the alliance it does not uh, it will not cease uh, 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 attacks against the Israeli uh, uh, the ships heading to Israel and uh, it has basically appealed the regional countries in the region not to join the uh, uh, US alliance because that basically would mean Houthi argument is that would mean adding the Israeli war in uh, against Palestinians they have also claimed uh, that the uh, uh, this particular alliance is nothing but an attempt to protect the Israeli interest and to militarize the Red Sea uh, in the name of protecting the freedom of navigation. So uh, it seems that the Houthis have uh, been determined to basically continue their offensive against the, uh, uh, the, the naval uh, shipments uh, uh, crossing uh, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, so if you see, uh, there are also reports, of course not confirmed, that the uh, the Iraqi militias have uh, basically fired uh, rockets, which basically has reached uh, uh, the Iraqi, uh, uh, sorry, Israeli city of Ilat. Though uh, again, uh, this is not yet confirmed that this is this is the claim made by the Iraqi militias. So, if you see, uh, 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 countries in the region are not happy with the way U.S. has basically watered down the resolution and made uh, U.N. resolution and made it meaningless. At the same time, the militias in the region have basically uh, uh, continued to uh, take aggressive actions against the Israeli uh, war in Gaza, demanding the immediate uh, cessation of hostilities, immediate cessation of war. Uh, so this is the overall situation uh, uh, as if now inside uh, uh, in the region. Thank you so much, Abdul, for speaking to us. The South Korean Supreme Court upheld two rulings by lower courts that ordered Japanese companies to pay compensation to 11 Korean forced labor victims. This was under Japanese colonial rule. The case was against Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Limited and Nippon Steel and was filed by Koreans who were forced into labor during World War II. However, this is not merely an incident from history as its implications continue today and the South Korean government has been moving closer to Japan despite many such issues being unresolved. We go to Anish for more. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. A verdict, of course, uh, about incidents, horrific incidents which took place many, many years ago during World War II, but also which has ramifications in today's context. So, could you first take us through what the case is about and what, who are these companies who are being against whom this verdict has gone? Well, there are two cases, actually, and the rulings uh, that were uh, given by the appellate courts and even uh, lower courts uh, before was that the... that individual claims of damages uh, during uh, the war time, especially those who were forced to uh, do you know, unpaid hard labor uh, in Japan, who were uh, drafted by the Jap uh, Japanese uh, colonial government at the time, uh, are liable to uh, you know, have the right to a file for damages and also secure those damages to begin with. Now, uh, we're looking at some of the very few uh, you know, last surviving uh, wartime forced labor victims. Uh, this includes uh, women, four of, uh, four of the victims, at least the three of them who are surviving at least, uh, are women uh, who were uh, put into what was called the volunteer women's corps. Uh, and uh, then there were, there is, uh, who were drafted by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries at the time 
uh, for uh, an airplane factory. And then there is the other uh, set of group who were uh, hired by Nippon Steel. Now, all of both of uh, in both cases, all the people were drafted against their will. They were taken by the go uh, colonial government uh, to work in very extreme, br extremely brutal conditions. And uh, many of them did die in many of these uh, factories and mines. And uh, these uh, these are you know generally consider war crimes in general because of, and also colonial crimes but japan has yet to confront that especially when it comes to korea because uh, korea was never a signatory to the san francisco treaty so it was never uh, seen as a party to the kind of wartime reparations that japan had to pay say to united states at the time uh, or UK, France, and so, so on. And so this is a very different kind of uh, a, a problem that, that has always been there, that has always been the dispute uh, between Japan and South Korea. And it's not the first time that uh, uh, Korean courts have actually uh, favored uh, victims of uh, wartime forced labor. Uh, before, in 2018, the same Supreme Court had, uh, you know, uh, favored uh, victims uh, against the same set of companies, uh, Mitsubishi and Nippon Steel, uh, uh, to grant them a similar uh, set of, uh, uh, you know, compensation. Uh, most of them are dead now. Uh, in fact, uh, since they have filed the case, it was uh, like many of these litigations began in early 2010s, uh, and uh, most most of them couldn't survive because obviously they are too old right now and. Uh, and it is, uh, and it, and it uh, remains to be seen if they ever get paid in their own lifetime. Uh, at the same time, what we're looking at, as you pointed out, there are real-time implications right now because obviously the current conservative government has been trying to uh, push through, uh, you know, ram through actually a sort of uh, a reconciliation with Japan that actually comes at the cost of national interest very often done at the behest of or at the encouragement of the United States who wants to create a sort of access uh, against China, obviously, and also North Korea. And uh, this sort of uh, drawing of borderlines has actually cost uh, and will cost Korea uh, a situation where it is going to overlook uh, its own citizens' uh, needs and, you know, the, uh, the demands of, of wartime victims, and not just wartime victims, colonial uh, era victims, many of them, uh, which includes all sorts of other crimes, including the comfort women issue that, uh, that Korea doesn't really want to address in most uh, instances. And uh, that is uh, being done at their cost. And uh, this thought that, that is being lauded by mainstream media in the West and also in Japan uh, is coming uh, at time uh, when North Korea is re sorry South Korea is ready to uh, just forget its colonial history with Japan and the kind of crimes that has been inflicted on its people. I wanted to ask you a bit more about that. What has been the trajectory of ties between Japan and South Korea in the past? How have they sort of uh, you know dealt with it, and what has changed over the past few years? Well, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is like every time there has been a conservative government, uh, there has always been a rightward tilt and that rightward tilt meant, meant that it, uh, they tried to uh, secure very close military ties with Japan, uh, you know, forgetting a, a large part of the colonial uh, baggage that exists and which has never been resolved. Uh, and this was something that was pretty much a legacy of the military dictatorship that existed until the 80s, uh, especially under Park Chang-hee, who actually, uh, you know, led the process of signing the 1965 treaty, which pretty much gave Japan a, a very quick shortcut out of, uh, you know, paying reparations, paying for, uh, or, you know, even uh, giving an apology uh, a formal apology uh, for not just uh, colonizing the country, the peninsula, but also inflicting a significant amount of damage and, uh, you know, crimes and atrocities against the Korean people. And it's not just Korea, obviously, Japan has a, you know, very terrible history of colonialism, uh, especially in the 40s and late 30s. Uh, when it colonized parts of China, parts of Southeast Asia, and committed the kind of crimes that uh, are yet to be reckoned uh, with. And that is something uh, uh, where, you know, often there are political divisions uh, in uh, South Korea as well. And obviously, North Korea 
uh, to where it's not more, so much divisions, but obviously it has been demanding, but has been overlooked over any talks of settlements or reparations. Uh, nevertheless, uh, under the previous government of Moon Jae-in, uh, there, uh, there was an attempt by the Korean, South Korean government to actually support the victims of war crimes, support the victims of forced labor, uh, of people, uh, women who were forced into, uh, forced into being comfort women, uh, and uh, that actually created tensions. No, but it wasn't like the kind of tensions that broke relations or created irreparable damage. It was just tensions uh, where Japan just refused to acknowledge any of these crimes. Uh, but under the Yoon government, the government has been trying to, you know, pretty much bend over backwards to actually accommodate Japan. Even right now, what we're seeing is the government trying to uh, give a roundabout way by creating this foundation where it will make, uh, you know, Korean companies, obviously, who, uh, you know, who uh, gained from the settlement of 1965 to pay for the victims. But it pretty much gives J Japanese companies and Japan itself a way out of even giving an apology or paying for the victims or even taking responsibility for the kind of crimes that they have committed. And this is the kind of thing that uh, that is being done just so that South Korea can actually have stronger military ties. Earlier today, there has already been statements given by uh, both the governments of trying to, uh, you know, go for a more dynamic relationship and, you know, spearhead a situation where, you know, Japan might even possibly have uh, base access, military base access, or even have a military base in South Korea. So that is the side, kind of situation that they are in. But these court cases kind of remind the uh, conservatives, uh, the conservative ruling dispensation that it is not going to be as simple as that because obviously a lot of these victims have very uh, great public support. They are not uh, forgotten. It pretty much, uh, you know, reminds people of the nationalist history that existed uh, and much of what uh, has been uh, uh, betrayed by this, uh, different kind of right-wing regimes and conservative governments over the years. So this is definitely one of the stumbling blocks that South Korea will have to deal with when it tries to build the kind of alliance, an anti-China alliance with Japan and the United States. Thank you, Anish, so much for that update. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back on Tuesday with another fresh episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.